everybody, we have our 230 presentation. This is Bernie Inocente. He's going to talk about uh, Amiga hardware for Commodore 64 users. Go, Bernie. The new Commodore technology, <laughs> Amiga technology, it's 1632 bits technology that's much superior to the Commodore 64. You guys oh, use. don't say that. Oh, <laughs> well, actually, not so much. Um, so, here is the, what the motherboard of an Amiga looks like. And uh, many of you will know these things already. Um, I, I don't know how much time I have to go into details, but I'll make a very quick overview. So the Amiga was not just a refresh of Commodore technology. They just both Amiga technologies, like they're, they're both a separate company. It was like long story of auction, it was Atari involved. But anyway, when Commodore acquired it, there were already prototypes. There were, you know, wired prototypes of the custom chips and uh, Commodore put in the money to productionize it and made it, make it in, like, into mass production. So this Amiga 500 is already a second model, second generation Amiga. The first Amiga, as you know, is the 1000 over there. The chips changed marginally. The 1000 had this uh, um, like normal Agnus, and this one is the fat Agnus, which is a um, uh, part fat pack, I think. Um, so the 60FK is uh, basically a six, this is a 16-bit bus, 32-bit core uh, from Motorola, and uh, it's 7.14 megahertz on the original Amiga design, on the classic Amiga, uh, but very marginally faster than the 6502. Because it's microcoded, because um, the bus is only 16 bits, but many things are 32 bits, it requires two bus, uh, uh, two bus uh, cycles to, to do things like fetch an address, um, then it was actually just a little faster. And it, it had hardware multiplication, 16-bit multiplication, so it had a few advantages over the 6502, but not much. What made the Amiga special is not so much the CPU, but the fact that there were these uh, helper chips that took, uh, basically, from the Commodore that was mostly CPU-based uh, graphics and CPU-based everything, to DMA-based everything. So the CPU is just on the on the side of the, of the Amiga design. The real core of the Amiga design is the DMA chip, which is the Agnes. So I have this uh, very, very high level schematic. Um, <laughs> so the three Amiga custom chips that make the architecture are Agnes, Denise, and Paula. So Denise is a video controller. Um, unlike the VIC, um, so it can do th eight sprites like the VIC, just like the same, uh, but it can read memory from pretty much any address, 16-bit um, aligned, but it can read in any uh, location from the RAM, starts reading from there, and start clocking out the, um, like scanning out uh, to the video hardware, to the, to the um, video composite hardware in, in this case, um, from any location. And it can keep going, and then it keep going all the way to the bottom of the screen. But there was also another cool processor embedded inside Agnes called the Copper. And the Copper was a, a mini CPU with only three instructions mm -hmm. that was able to basically synchronize with the, with the screen raster like it would do raster effects with the CPU doing nothing while the CPU is just free. So you basically, as the, as the raster is drawing, basically, at any time, you could have like an, an instruction wait in the, in the copper list that says, you know, wait for this line. And then at this point, you would basically poke, uh, move actually, move uh, some value like one, two, three in register uh, four, five, six, right? So this was able to move into the registers of the other chips over anywhere really, um, values. And this would allow to do the, the things that you've seen all Amigas do, like the, the scrolling screens. So you basically, at any point, you could turn off DMA and then execute a bunch of moves and then return on the DMA. And then uh, here you had like, you know, low resolution and here you have high resolution. And then you could do this again throughout the screen and then you can have a different palette. And uh, because you can also, modify the pointers to um, where the Paula would, uh, pardon, Denise would start and stop uh, scanning for, you know, scanning out the, the, uh, the bit planes, and I will talk about the bit planes later. Then you can um, basically scroll horizontally the screen or scan the screen, and this is all done without copying memory. It's all done by just changing a register in a, in a chip, and even the changing of the register is done by another custom chip. So this was basically the core of the Amiga architecture that let you do high, res high resolution, uh, 
60 or 50 hertz uh, graphics real time uh, where computers of the time could not do much, could not update the whole screen in one, uh, in one frame. Um, in addition to this, the Amiga had this, uh, basically had no text mode. Like it moves away from uh, computers being basically the video controller being mostly a, a character generator with extra graphics added as a, you know, as a next generation layer on top. Amiga doesn't have text mode, it only has graphics mode. Mm. And the frame buffer, basically, if you want to type write text, you have to copy, you have to copy little, little images that you can store in memory somewhere else. So another thing that's an innovation of the Amiga is that there is no dedicated banks of memory for anything. Like all this RAM that you see here is available for DNA, for DNA from all these custom chips. This is called the chip memory for this reason. It's also shared with the CPU, but the CPU has lower priority access to it. So as you increase the amount of uh, graphics that you do, and you also turn on sound and turn on other DMAs, uh, the CPU, basically, they steal cycles from the CPU, and eventually the CPU starts and can do very little. That's another reason why the 68K on the Amiga was very poor compared to the 6502 of the Subcom 64, is that it, it also could not even access the bus all the time. <laughs> Um, oh, feel free to interrupt me with questions and interrupt me with, me with corrections because not all the things I say are true anymore or, you know, it's based out of memory and this talk is uh, completely unprepared. As you can see, this machine here has an expansion port and there is an extra memory here. So this, some people were, call, were calling this the fast memory as opposed to the cheap memory. But this is not fast memory. The truth is, on an Amiga 500, this is on the same bus of the chip memory. It's just mapped to an address that w was way out of the, basically this custom chips had a 20-bit uh, bus. It was like a, they could only address one megabyte of mem uh, memory. And there was half megabyte here and half megabyte here, but in the wrong place. For some reason, the designers of the Amiga 500 didn't think of um, basically mapping this just after. And they made this uh, slow RAM. Slow RAM is basically, mm -hmm. gets uh, this, the cycle stolen from chip, but you can also not put graphics here. Because if you do, then the chips cannot reach for it. Like they, they, they will basically um, alias alias the the low little memory. Um, there is another bus here. This is called the Zorro bus. Mm -hmm. The Amiga 1000 uh, had on the opposite side. Like the, they had like format problems. You know, like the form problems in which the, there was no interoperability. But this bus is really the CPU bus, plus some extra controls and the auto configuration stuff. The Amiga was also unique in uh, being able to auto configure boards without having to uh, like mess with jumpers or anything. Like it would just, uh, uh, the operating system, a startup would map them to a specific address and it would require extra glue logic on the, on the external board for it to remap itself to where it should go. And then, uh, you know, interrupts and all these things would be configurable so they don't conflict with each other. This is like, a, was a dream of a platform when DOS was, you know, you had a serial port for your mouse and the video card doesn't work anymore, these kind of things, right? So, um, another innovation of the Amiga is the sound was PCM 8-bit four channels on st stereo. So you have, you can play PCM music, but it has a, like a, it comes at a loss compared to the SID it doesn't really have any way to synthesize, like it doesn't have a synthesizer, and so you can only do PCM. And uh, if you want to do anything more, then you need the CPU to, more, like you, you can change the volume, you can change the, the frequency of the replay free, the play frequency, but you have to do this in software, and it takes a lot of extra CPU time to do that. So it was more limited for synth music, but it was great for, you know, it, you could do speech, you could do all the things that Commerce 64 was not very good at. So. You know, it's a compromise, let's say. And only four voices, but later on, uh, software techniques improved such that you basically people would just batch two channels on the left and two channels on the right with different volumes so they could have more bits of resolution. They basically get, they adapt it anal in an analog way, but you make one very, very faint and the other one very loud. You can even calibrate them. You could do 14-bit uh, PCM sound on two channels. And then you do the other channels that you need, you just do them in software by mixing in software, which was you know, heavyweight. And the, on the 68K, you could do eight channels, let's say, maximum, while the CPU, like the mouse is frozen, <laughs> stuff like that, yeah. So anyway, um, uh, other things that are notable, uh, so far so good, but yeah, go ahead. 
the Amiga is really well known for its mod scene. Mm -hmm. Where do those instruments come from? So the the first sound tracker I remember um, using had a disc called ST00, which was the main program, and then there were additional extra discs, ST01, 003, and those had samples. So back in that era, samplers were expensive, rare. Samplers for the Amiga, I think they started appearing years later. Um, so they probably had been sampled on other architectures and then transferred to the Amiga somehow. Like very famously, the, the Boeing demo, there was like a very loud uh, sound boom. Yeah, that one was sampled with an 8-bit sampler on a different architecture by someone by throwing a ball in against the against the the garage door. <laughs> so that's the that's at least the myth. Um, so sampling was difficult, and probably people would do, were doing this on workstations like uh, on Sun or other machines at the time. The first sampler I used on the Amiga would hook up to the parallel port. And uh, by the way, the Amiga has two CIA chips. It's like the same CIA of the Commodore 64. It was the same chip, and it would break the same way. The serial and the parallel were very dangerous. Like you had to plug them in when the machine's off, or right, right. you know, make sure you're grounded. Everything is grounded because they, they would break easily. And then you would have a fried CIA and a typical trick from you know poor boy who's you know doesn't have the money to buy a new one is to swap them. So you would have the broken parallel port on uh, something you don't care about. Uh, yeah, it's like, oh, I fried the cereal, I need the cereal, so psh, you just uh, swap it and then you lose the parallel or stuff like that. Um, the two CIAs were mapped to string, because they're 8-bit uh, chips, some of the address decoding is done externally, and uh, for, um, like, to save on cost, they're, they're mapped, one at even addresses, they're one at odd addresses, so they're called the odd CIA and even CIA on the Amiga for this reason. It just saved a little bit of glue logic. Uh, to do that, but there were still 8-bit registers spaced enough so that the CPU would always write on the on the low part of the bus or on the high part of the bus. So this is a basically a transition architecture where there are some 8-bit things, some 16-bit things mostly, mostly 16 bits, and a CPU that's 32 bits but only inside, and only some opcodes. Like it could move 32 bits, it could add the 32 bits, but it couldn't multiply them because it didn't have enough space in the, um, you know, in the in the microcode plus ALU to do that. So much later, the uh, Amiga 1200s um, were updated to have full 32-bit things, and the chipset got refreshed, but not all of it, because my, uh, my, pardon, Commodore was kind of running out of money, so they did the AGA up refresh, which mm. was only refreshing the graphics side of it, and mostly the Denise was redone, but for example, the sound did not change at all, it was still what it was. It was good. It was good enough, I think, for the time. So another peculiarity of the Amiga, and this is maybe unique in these other than uh, game consoles, maybe. So graphics in the Amiga was bit plane oriented. Basically, what you see on the screen, if you see like four colors, it's actually two separate planes of the same size, let's say, that are next to each other. And there are two different addresses. And there are two registers in the Danese that say read from here for bit plane 0 for bit plane 1. Then the, the chip would read basically the first word, 16 bits, and the second and the first word here, and combine them such that basically, like these are the 16 bits. Let's let's say they're 16, and these are the other 16 bits of bit plane zero, bit plane one, and they would just take this thing and this thing, and this is, let's say you have four color mode, then these are the two bits. Uh, let's say one one, then it's color three, right? If it says uh, one zero, that's color two, and so on. And then it would look up in the lookup table. So another innovation of the Amiga was that it had like 60 million colors. Um, pardon, um, it had fewer, <laughs> 4,096 colors. Uh, it was a 12 bits RGB system. And basically there were 32, 32, uh, uh, look up, uh, color lookup registers, let's say LUT. So there was a lookup table of 32. You would basically look up, uh, this would be entry number three, uh, one, zero, one, two, three, number three is the fourth. And then these would say uh, red, blue, green. And the red, blue, green were expressed in like four bits per component, so you only get 12 bits of color, which is 4,096 colors. Um, later in the in the AGA um, enhancement, then there were eight bits per color, and it would be full full 24 bits, but uh, still limited to 32. Uh, pardon, 
250, yeah, no, they had 256, just very slow, though, because you need an 8-bit plane for that. So this doesn't scale very well to many colors. It, it scales well up to 4 or 5, but then it starts to become very slow to update, because every time you want to draw graphics, you want to draw a line, if the line is, uh, you know, has to be color number three and you have to change all these bits. You have to update all these pixels and then update all these pixels on another plane. And if you have five or six of them, you have to draw five lines instead of one. That's not great for 3D graphics, but it's not great for vector games. So the Amiga was good at other things where you could uh, play tricks with the palette, basically. So you could, let's say that you had like five bit planes on screen and uh, you have three of them be the background and uh, two of them be some foreground, and you could scroll them independent of each other because each one of these could start at different memory locations anytime. So you could use tricks with the copper or with the CPU to scroll things relative to each other. So you get this uh, parallactic scroll in English, is it called this way? Parallax. Yeah, parallax. Yeah, parallax, and for free, basically. Um, you just uh, basically give up, give up on having more colors on screen, obviously, because you, you think of it as having three bit planes be eight colors for the background, and the other two being four colors for the foreground. So uh, for the uh, 64 color extra half right mode, yeah. were they using a six bit plane? Uh, yes, they had six bit planes, but only 32 registers, and the trick was that in hardware, there was a shadow set of 32 registers that were shifted right by one, so they were just half the brightness. That's why it's called mm -hmm. half bright. Mm -hmm. So you were limited in, basically you couldn't define 32 more colors. You reuse the same ones with half the brightness. Turned out this was very useful because for shading, right? You, you basically use a six bit plane, uh, very, very common um, like Amiga shoot em ups or, or, or um, platform games would have, for example, water and the water happens to make uh, everything darker. You would just do that by having, or any other effect, you basically have an effect where some feature on the screen darkens everything else, like a shadow, like character shadows. You could use this six-bit plane for that. Few games use the half-bright mode just because once, once you enable six-bit planes, you don't have a lot of cycles left for animation and so on. Uh, so I, I guess I'm done. Um, but yeah, I, I can uh, talk more uh, outside, maybe. Uh, when they talk about ham 6 or ham 8, mm. what does the number typically signify? OK, so th this is interesting, but it takes a while. Do I have time to answer, or sure. should I take it up? OK, so <laughs> ham was an interesting idea that got uh, canceled and then remained in the, in the silicon, luckily, just because it would take too long to remove uh, properly. So basically, the Amiga originally was supposed to be only video composite and was not supposed to be an RGB machine. Um, at some point, they decided that RGB screens were becoming a thing and you need to support RGB. So they switched from uh, you know, video composite to RGB. Once uh, the hand mode was supposed to basically hold and modify, basically over the pixels, you could hold the luminosity, keep it the same, and just change the color hue or you could change the saturation and just keep, so you could change one of the components. Once you do this in RGB, once you have these color registers that are red, green, and blue like this, um, it seems to make no sense anymore because nobody wants to keep the red the same and change only the blue or the green. It wouldn't not really make sense for photorealistic images, so they thought nobody would use this and they wanted to remove it. So they just didn't document it and they left it there just because otherwise the, the chip would have a hole in the middle with nothing and you know would save no money so they left it in and turned out actually that you couldn't make a paint program with this it was very hard because you mm. basically want to change wanna, you basically each pixel only specifies what to change in a kind of high compression lossy compression mode and if you want to draw a line you have to update also the previous previous or after pixel like mm. pixel before and after otherwise it bleeds right mm. so ham six would turn on all six planes and uh, basically we use the first two to control uh, what they're holding. You basically could hold the red, hold the green, hold the blue, or uh, look up something in the table. So you could also uh, take one of the, how many planes do you have? Six, four, one of the 16 registers that remain. Like you have six planes, so you, you basically, two are, are taken for this control word, and four remain for the specifying the color, or the, the component you're changing, or a palette. So with this, with this you could draw images that are reasonable, but you need good software to encode from uh, true color to this, and it would be slow to update it on the fly. But over time, techniques were developed. There, were, there was a paint program called Brilliance that was able to, in real time, move things on the screen, and the bleeding would be corrected 
kind of nasally, like uh, it would just uh, bleed and then uh, stop bleeding after a while, you just uh, fix it up. Uh, it was very, very clever. Ham 8 uh, was not possible on the Amiga Classic. You would need 8-bit planes for that, which you could only do with the AGA. And, um, and it enabled, uh, you know, these extra two bits that gives you a much larger palette and also six bits of resolution for each component. And then there was Sham. Uh, Sham uh, is an even more clever idea. It's a, basically, it's an or D ham, uh, dynamic ham. So the idea is that you use ham, but plus you use the copper. The copper, you don't, you're not limited to use it to just change between a screen and another. You can change colors anytime. So you can change colors in the palette, you can change a background color, you can change uh, pretty much anything at any time in a better line or even in the middle of the screen if you want. So initial sham encoders would just update some of the colors in the palette so that they would give you better matches for what you're doing. So if the top is, uh, let's say, blue sky and then uh, you have green stuff and so on, then you bas basically modify the palette through, through the image to give even better even better random. Well, why do you think more software back in the day didn't utilize such a powerful, impressive video mode? Hmm. So it was hard to encode things into this format, and uh, mostly it was limited by, you know, software not being ready yet. It was hard to develop. <coughs> Once it was developed, it was limited by being too static. Like basically, on top of an image like this, with all these tricks, you can only do sprites, and the Amiga sprites were more limited than the Commodore 64. The Commodore 64 sprites could be expanded vertically, horizontally, they were wider, they were 24 bits if I remember correctly. The Amiga ones are worse, they're only 16 bits. Hmm. And uh, you only have 8 of them, uh, of course you can recycle them with the copper too, so you can do the same tricks you do on the Commodore 64, but it's free, like it doesn't take any CPU cycles, any interrupts. Um, but basically it was limited for games, you couldn't use it much for games or for the UI, because it's too slow to update. For, uh, None of the like the only acceleration primitives that were supported in hardware on Amiga were line drawing, some filling that's pretty bad actually. Uh, it works, uh, you know, in, with, with limitations, let's say, and uh, what else? And copying blocks of memory. You could uh, mem copy basically uh, rectangular regions on the other things. But all of those um, were pretty slow. Like the Amiga 500 didn't have enough bandwidth with a lot of bit planes on to m to move large blocks of memory. At 60 hertz, you you would you would see things, uh, and there were a lot of games on the Amiga that were excessive, had excessive graphics, and they were, for this reason, not very uh, smooth. So I guess I'm done, unless there are more questions for Bernie. Okay, thank you, Bernie.